Hello everyone, my name is Spencer Walsh, welcome to today's show, we got a good one for you as always, it is Friday, we got a full week of shows in, very very excited about all of that, here is what is on the agenda for today, the UAW, they are standing up in more places than ever as of today at noon, one week ago we brought you news of the strike starting today. It is expanding. We'll take a look at strategy and how the first week has gone. Uh, so far, UAW seems to be holding up pretty well. We will give you the full, obviously, context on that. Big news out of New Jersey slash Washington today where Robert Menendez, probably one of the worst Democrats in the Senate today, was indicted on a corruption case charge Six years after his trial on a different corruption case ended in a hung jury. Also, the Intercept is a great and important look about how APAC is targeting black Democrats, all while the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, refuses to do anything about it. Meanwhile, the bomb threat, a a bomb threat, excuse me, has cleared a uh, school in the suburbs of Chicago, an elementary school, was cleared at 10.15 a.m. by police. Class was resuming by late morning. Um, and it seems that it could be all tied to one extremist social media post. We'll break that all down for you. It is going to be a great show. It's going to be an important show. So thank you so much for listening. It is Newsflash. All right, so we start off today with the UAW. They're getting into it. They're getting excited. They are getting, uh, you know, getting more and more energy. You can really start to see it today. Uh, they significantly raise the pressure on General Motors and Stellantis, the parent companies of Jeep, uh, the parent company of Jeep and Ram, by expanding its strike against the companies to include all the spare parts distribution centers of the two companies. So pretty much, uh, kind of cutting down. You know, more and more of the circulation of their supply chain here. Uh, you know, they're just yeah, gradually getting more and more into it. They're, you know, kind of getting the sense now that you can really with with these, uh, you know, expanding of operations, you can begin to cut off more and more of their profit. You can begin to cut off more and more of their operations, but you can still certainly leave room to escalate or, you know, take steps back. If they start to concede on your demand, it seems to be kind of the clear strategy here for the UAW. But here, by widening the strike to distribution centers, which supply parts to dealership for repairs, the union is effectively taking its case to consumers, some of which might find it difficult or impossible to have their cars and trucks fixed, uh, which is a it's a pretty big deal. Um Strategy could pressure the automakers to make more concessions to the union, but it could backfire on the union by frustrating car owners and turning them against the UAW. Sean Fain, the union's president, said, and it all, you know, it all depends. I think starting off with 75% of the country supporting you is a pretty good way to start. You know, that is almost certainly going to go down, you know, as things become more protracted, you know, week in and week out, you know, depending on how long this fight lasts. And if you look at, I, I think this is going to be much closer to the, uh, the Hollywood situation rather than the, uh, the Teamster situation, you know, this could be a much more kind of protracted situation just given how much they are, you know, fighting for here, how much they want to really, really change the system. And honestly, you know, I think it is, you know, not something that they, I think they're going to end up having some sort of resolution. But I think the good thing and the important thing is now that the, there is a general pro labor attitude. Labor has built up a lot of kind of political capital with the people, a lot of goodwill over these last few years. And they haven't really had so much of a chance to spend it when things really do get tough. Um, and I think, you know, A, if there's anyone to spend it in the right way to deal with it and to navigate the kind of trickiness of the situation in the right way is going to be Sean Fain. I would probably feel one of the most you – know, I'd feel comfortable with him at the helm. Um, and if there's an ever – if there was ever a time to really spend that political capital, that put, that time would be now. Um, so, yeah, the union's president, Sean Fain, said Friday that workers at 38 distribution centers all across the country um, – are going to going to be walking off the job. He said the two companies had not progressed significantly in contrasting them with Ford Motors, which I also think is smart because it shows, you know, again, we are strong, we are firm, but we are also reasonable. We are going to, you know, we're going to give you the the props that you deserve here if you make concessions. It seems to be, uh, you know, a pretty effective strategy. But right now, all signs point to things going pretty well. Um, 
obviously that could change in it at any moment in all signs point to them you know kind of sw- s- slowly starting to you know eat away it's kind of a chipping <laughs> excuse me it's kind of a chipping away approach at the UAW distribution strategy here because it is it is yeah it is really something that is quite um quite gradual it seems you know we're, there's all you know, it's like tons and tons of various ones all throughout the country um right now though there has been you know from Oregon to Massachusetts to Florida to Dallas to LA to even Reno Nevada all four corners of the country uh there's one around New York as well that's that's getting that getting kind of called out of on the line here um you know you can tell that they're definitely kind of beginning to this kind of con- contrasting situation of you know giving them a little bit of room to you know uh improve giving them room to kind of walk back if things go the way of the UAW but still at the very same time keeping things uh you know room to you know move in further giving them more more rope to squeeze the uh the the big three with so the affected locations include 18 GM distribution centers that employ a total of 3,475 workers and 20 Salanta centers with 2,150 UAW members according to the union the move brings the total of striking UAW workers up to more than 18,000 um so of course they say uh today strike escalation by uaw's top leadership again you can see the little tricks in the framing here this is not something that was done by the uaw top leadership this is something that was approved uh you know this strike strategy this you know this effort to go on strike uh you know was approved by every single uh, local was improved by the entire union. So the fact that they are, you know, obviously not to the same degree for every single one, but the the idea that that is going to be something that's, you know, they were just forcing it on. Uh, that's what, you know, of course, the the big union bosses were forcing it on the workers who just want to stay and be good little workers in the factories. You know, that's obviously what GM wants to think. But democratically, you know, based on the structure of how this was decided, was decided by, you know, a massive, I was like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 95%, 97% mandate. Um, you know, this was not something that was forced on from the top down, like this framing would have you believe. They say we have contingency plans for various scenarios and are prepared to do what's best for our business, our customers, and our dealers. Representatives for Stellantis did not immediately provide comments on the strike's expansion, but the union has said that not striking more facilities at Ford was because of the gains it had achieved in talks with the company. To be clear, we are not done at Ford, Fain said. We have serious issues to work through, but we want to recognize that Ford is serious about reaching a deal. It'll be interesting to see how you know Ford responds to this kind of you know show of goodwill, this acknowledgement that there is some sort of progress, there is some sort of effort being made to you know say hey let's go a little bit further. And then I think if they resolve some sort of contract and it's anywhere close to what the W wants, that is a huge pressure because that is a kind of break in the the solidarity line of the other side of the big three and saying hey well you know look at Ford they're, they're, they did what they, they had to do you know Stellantis GM what's the hold up here come on you know so I think that, like, that's a very very effective very very powerful uh, method of going about things uh, but of course it all kind of comes down I think this this deal that they come up with if they come up or are able to come up with any, any kind of major deal here it could be really really important to watch because it could be really really indicative of where the pressure goes will go on the you know the UAW to kind of uh you know follow through and do a deal with everyone else or will go on or you know kind of a, a deal that they did with Ford that turned out to be more favorable to Ford or will they you know really win in the deal out of Ford and then kind of force the other of the big three the other two of the big three to do the same yeah so a lot of stuff going on here as well interesting stuff on the political side in his remarks which were broadcast live on Facebook Fain so yeah, Biden was called in by Fain to come down the, the UAW picket line. You know, Trump is doing that speech where he's going to, you know, just pull friendly un- union members into this big hall and have them all cheer for him. It's not even going to be, you know, UAW members specifically. It's just going to be random members. Um, yeah, so the union, though, at times has expressed unease with the president's policy on electric vehicles and withheld its endorsement in the 2024 presidential race, which, you know, is a little bit interesting because it actually shows that, you know, in the, this is a, something that very many major parts of the Democratic coalition understand or, you know, fail to understand, excuse me, is that if Joe Biden isn't doing anything for you, you are under no, like, you know, formal obligation to endorse him. You know, you can try and put some sort of pressure on him to acquiesce to what you want him to do it's not a crime it's politics you know it is something that's it's you are supposed to do um on the political sphere 
And you can see that Biden has already made some in pretty, really incredibly conciliatory comments. They really made some, you know, very friendly, very, you know, saying, you know, union workers, both America, all the stuff that he normally says, but really saying, you know, the, even almost parroting Sean Fain's lines in some of his, you know, remarks about this, which is, you know, pretty surprising. That still doesn't mean he, you know, shouldn't cede the ground. Um, you know, he strongly supported the UAW members in his remarks at the White House last week, um, which is, is, is pretty interesting. The union does usually endorse Democratic candidates, but again, has not endorsed Biden yet. And Biden, you know, spoke very sporting, sportively of him. Uh, but is he going to take that ground to Trump by letting him show up there to Detroit alone and not having Biden just pop in right after? So, yeah, um, very, very interesting stuff. A lot of stuff going on on the political side, a lot of stuff going on on kind of the labor relations side as well. So all of that will be followed very, very closely. So with that being said, we will move on. All right, so now to our next story. We are we got some pretty big news coming out of New Jersey. As I said before, New Jersey slash Washington, because I don't know exactly where the indictment is being played. But, uh, yeah, here it is, Robert Menendez. Um, so this is how it sounded. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it was in New York today because in the Southern District of New York, this is where it was being investigated um, by... Damien Williams, U.S. Attorney of the Southern District of New York, who was coming out and he made this that between 2018 and 2022, Senator Menendez, the senior U.S. Senator from New Jersey and the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and his wife, Nadine Menendez, engaged in a corrupt relationship with Hanna, Uribe, and Davies. The indictment alleges that through that relationship, the senator and his wife accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes in exchange for Senator Menendez using his power and influence to protect and to enrich those businessmen and to benefit the government of Egypt. The indictment alleges that Hana, Uribe, and Davies provided bribes in the form of cash, gold, home mortgage payments, a low-show or a no-show job for Nadine Menendez, a Mercedes-Benz, and other things of value to the senator and his wife. So, yeah, there you have it. That is him coming up on some corruption charges there. A classic corruption case for sure. Um, so, yeah, three-count federal indictment, which also charges the senator's wife and three New Jersey businessmen, accuses him of using his official position in a wide range of corrupt schemes. In one, he sought to secretly provide the uh, Egypt with sensitive U.S. government information, which is a, probably a pretty big no-no right there. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. In others, he aimed to influence criminal investigations of two New Jersey businessmen, one of whom was a longtime fundraiser for Mr. Menendez. Toward the end, a senator recommended that uh, the Senator recommend that end, excuse me, the Senator recommend that President Biden nominate lawyer Philip Stellinger for U.S. Attorney for New Jersey because Menendez believed that he could influence Stellinger's prosecution of the fundraiser, uh, the indictment said. Stellinger, who was ultimately not confirmed for the post, has not accused of any wrongdoing. In another scheme, Menendez tried to use his position to disrupt an investigation and prosecution by the New Jersey State Attorney General's office, according to the indictment. In exchange for all those actions, the indictment said the senator and his wife, Nadine, accepted cash gold payments toward a home uh, cash gold payments toward a home mortgage, a luxury vehicle, and other valuable things. Constituent service is not part of any legislator's job. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Constituent service is part of any legis legislator's job. Senator Menendez is no different. Damian Williams, U.S. Attorney for Southern District of New York, said at a news conference announcing the charges, he said that Mr. Menendez's Senate website explicitly states that the kinds of services he would not provide, uh, explicitly states the services he could not provide because they would be improper, but he said that obviously behind the scenes, Menendez was doing those things for certain people, the people who were bribing him and his wife. Uh, so soon after the news coverage, uh, Menendez issued a page-long denial, blaming the charges on forces behind the scenes that have repeatedly attempted to silence my voice and dig my political grave. He said that he was confident that this matter will be successfully resolved once all the facts are presented and my fellow New Jerseyans will see this for what it is. So kind of, yeah, coming out with the full denial. But it seems to be, you know, once you get the indictment stage, 
I think with a senator, you really do not see that very often with with senator coming in for indictment. Um, it is something that is it's it's pretty rare. You know, you can only count on since like two thousand on maybe two hands the amount of times where that's happened. Um, you know, not to say that senators are corrupt, but the fact that they do it so blatantly and so openly uh, that the Justice Department has to come in and be like, okay, you know, this is this is a little bit too much here. You know, you're accepting gold bars from Egyptian businessmen and getting your nose in and all these, you know, kind of state level investigations. Um, you know, you're trying to lobby, you know, for President Biden. You're trying to tell Egypt some, you know, state secrets. Like, ugh, it does not seem very good. You know, this, there, there's always a point where the line has to be drawn. But yeah, they they are coming out. With a, you know, it seems when you go to the indictment stage, though, it seems like it's going to be a pretty tough road to hoe uh, in terms of defense here for Menendez. But uh, him and his lawyer, David Chertler, say that the client has not broken any laws. Um, also, that goes for uh, Miss Menendez. That's Miss Menendez's lawyer is David Chertler. Uh, Miss Menendez denies any criminal conduct and will vigorously contest these charges in court. Representatives for the two businessmen could not immediately be reached for comment on the charges. A spokesperson for Hannah said in a statement, "We were we are still reviewing the charges, but based upon our initial review, they have absolutely no merit." The charges against Menendez, 69, follow a lengthy investigation by the FBI and federal prosecutors in Manhattan and comes nearly six years after his trial on unrelated claims of corruption ended with a hung jury. So, I mean, again, if you this is already your second go around and you you didn't even get off. You didn't even get acquitted. You just got a hung jury. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not that impressive. Um, yeah, so the businessmen named in the indictment, which were unsealed in a Manhattan fe- uh, federal court, are Fred Davies, a prominent New Jersey real estate developer and fundraiser for Menendez, Whale Hanna, a longtime friend of Mrs. Menendez, who worked in a halal meat certification business, uh, this is where the Egyptian ties come in, and Jose Uribe, who works in the trucking and insurance business. The 39-page indictment charges uh, the senator, his wife, and the businessman with conspiracy to commit bribery and conspiracy to commit honest services wire fraud. And also charged Mr. Menendez and his wife with conspiracy c- to commit extortion under the color of official right, meaning using his official position to force someone to give them something of value. According to the indictment, Menendez at one point, uh, this is the wife, bragged that actions she took on behalf of Hannah would make him more powerful than the president of Egypt. Um, so this is the yeah, this is the Egyptian god that um, she was doing favors for, um, and the fact that she was in good with him apparently would make, make him more powerful than you know CC or whoever the president is there. Um, during a search of the couple's home and a safe deposit box in Miss Menendez's name, investigators found more than five hundred fifty thousand dollars in cash. Wow. Much of it hidden in clothing, closets, and a safe. Some of the cash was stuffed in envelopes and contained the fingerprints or DNA of Mr. Davies or his driver, who is not named. So it pretty much appears that they, I, I, like, I don't know how they, they raid this. Like, they're, they're, the fact that when the FBI raided the couple's home, no one even seemed to notice or care, which is, like, certainly, I think, notable. But, um, like, you know, I'm just like, I feel like a senator's home being raided normally is, is going to be a pretty big deal. I mean, unless I like missed that story, which I do not think that I did. Um, and they've, you know, again, you're normally because he's, he's coming out with all these statements today. Menendez is saying like they don't want to see the first Latino American, uh, you know, from New Jersey succeed, you know, or something like that. Some some sort of gibberish, you know, along those lines. And it's just like. You know, if you were really not that good, you're, you're literally pulling like a Tony Soprano and hiding things in your clothes, hiding cash in your clothes, like, you know, closets, safes, like, you know, is, you're going to be pulling, you know, hundred dollar rolls of hundred dollar bills out of like the soup cans and you want people to believe that you're not guilty and you're just being targeted because, you know, people don't want to see you succeed because you're race or something like that. It's like, like, eh, it's, it's almost like, come on, isn't it's this, there's sometimes where you're like, okay, this person could be, you know, let's hear him out. You know, it could be a real tough situation, you know, some sort of you know, mistake. You know, give me a chance to get all those facts out there. But this is not that case. Like this is, this is really quite, quite ridiculous. So uh, if Menendez were to step down before the end of his term, uh, New Jersey's Democratic Governor Phil Murphy were, would be um, responsible for appointing a successor. But he is already facing a challenger, uh, the Republican mayor of Mendenboro, 
New Jersey has announced that she will compete for the seat. Uh, Mr. Davies, who pleaded guilty last year to a financial crime and is awaiting sentencing, is among the small group of builders responsible for converting parts of the polluted Hudson River waterfront into a bustling hive of residential and commercial activity. Uh, Menendez, his wife, and three co-defendants are expected to appear in the Manhattan Federal Court on Wednesday, according to Nicholas Piazza, spokesman for the Southern Districts. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, Menendez in trouble. Uh, good, interesting opportunity to fill that seat with someone better because, boy, when it comes to you know anything related to uh, foreign policy, was pretty much on the wrong side of every issue. One of the major forces, especially on the Democratic side, critical of any sort of normal normalization of relations with Cuba. Uh, so maybe that could be a little bit better. And of course, he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Also with Iran, he was very you know kind of on the wrong side of peace, to, to put it one way. Uh, <laughs> And so with that that being said, it could be interesting on a political level to see who comes in and replaces him. Okay, uh, with that being said, we will move on to our next story. So the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the country's most influential pro-Israel lobbying group, is recruiting candidates to challenge the progressive members of the Congressional Black, Black Caucus in primaries this year, or sorry, next year. Uh, so the CBC has been silent on the APAC bid to challenge at least three of the members who are part of the so-called squad, a loose group of progressive representatives. According to media reports, the Intercept's investigation, the only incumbents APAC has targeted so far this election cycle are CBC members. So this is something, you know, probably one of the most powerful caucuses singularly in Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, for sure, um, you know, filled with, you know, some of the most influential people in the House. Uh, you know, Jim Clyburn pretty much turned the Democratic primary, you know, in his direction. You know, he is somebody who has the ability to make a difference when he comes out and, you know, makes his voice heard. Um, but, you know, it comes down to what does he want to make his voice heard on? You know, what are the political things that he actually cares about? What are his true political interests? And it does not seem to be fighting for the interests of elected black representatives and, you know, stopping them from uh, primary challenges, especially you know, to when they're not necessarily being challenged by, you know, members of the same race. Um, yeah, so according to media reports and the Intercept's investigation, the only incumbent APAC has targeted, again, so far, are CBC members. The CBC's silence on the electoral challenges reflects a divide among the Democrats on Israel. With progressives increasingly willing to buck Capitol Hill orthodoxies and speak up for Palestinian rights, and further fundraising dynamics among uh, sorry, in fundraising dynamics among caucus members. Um, APAC has endorsed more than half of CBC members, which is pretty interesting. The APAC back members of the caucus, some 31 lawmakers, have received a previously unreported total of $3.6 million from APAC since February 2022, according to the FEC record. So that is probably right then and there. You know, half of their caucus is being funded by them. The other half probably wants to be so that they're not, you know, at the risk of these, uh, you know, primary challenges and attacks and things like that. So, no, they will not be making their voices heard to defend their fellow members any time soon. So the signs have given rise for calls for the CBT to speak up for the members on track, especially given APAC's propensity for directing Republican money to challenge incumbent progressives, uh, pro incumbent progressive Democrats in its primaries, oftentimes successfully. Look at you know Andy Levin in Michigan. Uh, you know this was that was someone who was Jewish, uh, not even black. Uh, you know it's APAC. And its Republican uh, donor, donors are intentionally targeting members of the Congressional Black Caucus with right-wing challenges, said Alexandra Rojas, Executive Director of Justice Democrats, which backed all five CBC members from the squad. The CBC and every Congress in Congress uh, has the opportunity now to demonstrate their power and stand up for all incumbents against APAC rule in fund funneling GOP dollars into APAC, excuse me, for into Democratic primaries. Some of the big hot spots on the list are Representatives Ilhan Omar. She gets challenged every year and Jamal Bowman, both because of their support for putting restrictions on USA to Israel, Jewish Insider reported last month. Uh, according to those, uh, according to three sources of knowledge of the recruiting process, um, who asked for anonymity, protect professional relationships, a pact as Pittsburgh area Democrat Lindsey Powell to challenge Representative Summer Lee, another member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Powell declined. Allegheny County Controller Corey O'Connor also declined an APAC invitation to challenge Lee, which is pretty incredible because they tried to spend tons and tons of money against her last time, but they completely came up flat, uh, which was really remarkable. Uh, so Powell declined to comment, and O'Connor did not respond to a request for comment. Bravini Patel, uh, a council member, is 
uh, in the city of Edgewood, Pennsylvania, is reportedly planning to run against Lee. Juice Insider reported that it was unable to confirm if APAC had met with Patel, uh, although he did not respond to a request for comment. Um, so, yeah, so APAC pr- proudly endorsed more than half of the Black Caucus last cycle in the United Democratic Project. Um, an APAC back super PAC helped ensure that pro Israel African American Democrats won in Ohio. A that's a you know clear reference to uh, Nina Turner there, North Carolina and Maryland. They also won their elections. An APAC spokesperson told the Intercept, uh, "While we may not have made any decisions on specific races this cycle, we are con- constantly evaluating every seat held by a detractor of the U.S. Israel relationship, and we base our assessments exclusively on their anti-Israel votes and statements." So yeah, I mean, there you go. Uh, it comes out pretty clearly right there uh, when you look at you know who, like, what are their motivations, and you know, it also I think is a pretty good clue into revealing some of the motivations of the Congressional Black Caucus, if you look at it, because they, it, it's really telling, like, this is what they're standing up for, uh, you know, or you can see what they're standing up for, and you can see what people like Jim Clyburn, who are, who is a leader on the Congressional Black Caucus, is standing up for, and it, they're standing up for when their bottom line, when their material interests, not their, you know, racial representation interests, which are, you know, very valid in my opinion, and are the reason why, you know, this caucus was founded in the first place. They're standing up when someone, you know, challenges their ability to take money from the pharmaceutical industry, as Jim Clyburn so loves to do. Um, they, and, you know, they're clearly standing up, or are not standing up, when some of their members dare to express opinions that are different than the status quo on Israel, um, and they are getting, you know, attacks again with Republican money, because they want to protect their bottom line, and their bottom line is the ability to get some of that same money for their own races and not have it spent against them. So, yeah, it's a clearly, you know, material interest uh, calculation here. They don't want to get attacked politically. They don't want to be on the wrong side of APAC, and they are showing it here at the expense of their, you know, so-called mission and raison d'etre. So, anyway, we do move on now to our last story. And it is a really a pretty horrific one. This is coming out of Highland Park in Chicago, or outside of Chicago. In elementary school, there was evacuated on Thursday morning after an unfounded bomb threat. Um, this was a Red Oak Elementary School, um, and it was cleared, but and a class was resumed, of course, by 10.15 a.m., uh, but questions were still being raised about whether the threat was tied to a social media post targeting the school. On Friday, an ex account that caters to a far-right and anti-LGBTQ audience posted a picture of a classroom at Red Oak that included a large pride flag and the school's handle. The message provocatively asked, why would an elementary school have a massive progress pride flag hanging above the students' heads all day? I love how they're like, they're so obsessed with this stuff that like they have to be able to call it, like they have to call it like the progress fl- pride flag. They can't just call it the pride flag. Like they're so like, they're more like into the nitty gritty of this stuff than like probably most gay people are on an everyday basis. Like they know what the difference between a pride flag and a progress pride flag. And it's like, if you, if you don't you know, know that, like you, you're, you must be sim- sympathetic to the groomers or something like crazy like that it's just it's not based in any sort of fact not based in any sort of reality and it's just you know literally cause someone like you know chaya raychick or whatever this is the person who who runs lives of tiktok she may think oh this is you know this is something that i'm just doing for for politics because i actually believe in this stuff or you know who even knows what her true motivations are if she she thinks you know the the progress pride flag is actually going to you know kill students or you know harm their development and and stuff like that or she just wants to you know get you know what everyone wants these days you know myself included you know look at what i'm doing right now uh you know a media career out of it you know she wants to get some some nice spot on fox railing against this stuff well i think she's you know kind of missed her moment on that you know with the with woke not being at all mentioned um in the last republican primary debate but like it this is the real consequence of it. Whatever she thinks she's doing, this is the real consequence of it. You know, we got Highland Park police spokesperson Amanda Bennett uh, saying she couldn't comment on any possible link to the social media posts. Again, this is you got school kids, elementary school kids, days being interrupted, and it's not because you know, it, like they don't care about like you know LGBTQ stuff. Like they're just trying to figure out who they can play with at lunchtime and who's going to sit next to them. 
you know, at the lunch table. So, like, who's going to be their partner for the math class activity? Like, they, like that is where their heads are at at this time. Like, you know, they're not thinking about this stuff. And when they see the you know, the pride progress flag, like, oh, you know, that's a cool rainbow. Like, wow, that's like they have no idea what it means. And it's not going to turn them into, you know, groomers and stuff like that either. Like, I think the the good news about all this stuff is like people are realizing how truly insane it is. Like, if you go up onto the street and say, you know, a pride progress flag is hanging over kids every day in their elementary school, you know, people aren't going to be like, oh my god, that's so horrible. We need to get this. They're going to be like, who the hell are you? Like, what the heck are you doing? Get away from me before they call the police. Like, this is scary. Like. You sound insane, you know, again, not someone that's going to win, you know, a majority in any kind of election or anything like that, you know, anytime soon, but it's still going to have that minoritarian effect of really, you know, freaking out, really inflaming a small, but very dangerous, very active, very organized sect of the population to do things like call in bomb threats to schools, get teachers fired, um, and, it's very soon probably going to be possible, pro- very more likely than not that someone is going to end up dead because of this this just ridiculous obsession with hunt- hunting down these individual schools and you know coming after these individual teachers in a very sick and disturbing way. So that is why that stuff really matters and is very very important to continue to follow and continue to follow it. We will on our next show this Monday. So please join us for that. Thank you so much. It's News Flash.